YouTube House Audio presents Warhammer 40k The Legacy of Russ Book 5 Infernus Written by Robbie McNiven and narrated by Warwyvern Ramilly's class Starfort designate Gormanyal. They had been wolves once, grey hunters, experienced warriors, their pelts flecked with silver and their armor etched with runes that told of great and bloody sagas. But they were wolves no more. The things that came at Brother Captain Stern and his grey knights down the flesh corridors of Gormanyal's primary docking spine wore only a semblance of their old selves, a mocking half facsimile. Blue-gray battleplate was now bent and twisted around fleshy growths, and scarred with the runes of an altogether darker tongue. The transhuman physique of the space marines had been similarly bent, changed to better suit the purposes of the insane things that now wore the wolves' flesh. Arms ended in bony claw growths, snapping maws, or spine-rimmed tentacles. Vox grills had become slavering jaws, and visor lenses blinked with raw eyelids. Lower limbs were double-jointed or cloven-hoofed. One beast's bare arms were covered in a million tiny chitin spines that gave the appearance of a bony fur pelt, while another had atrophied, leathery pinions sprouting grotesquely from the seal of its backpack. They had once been the red pelts, Gorman Yarl's space wolf garrison. Now they were monsters, possessed by the demons that infested the starfort, their bodies broken and abused, refashioned with no heed to nature's constraints. And they came straight for the Grey Knights, slavering, snapping, and howling. Stand firm, brethren, Stern shouted, raising his nemesis force sword. Suffer not the unclean to live. The two sides, silver paladins and possessed warp wolves, met with a crash of ceramite and snapping bone. The foremost demon, a thing with a red pelted wolf's head and crab claw arms, went straight for stern. The grey knight captain met it with a downward slash of his four sword, silver steel cleaving through warped plate to back off one of the monstrosity's snapping limbs. The thing didn't even flinch, latching the other claw around stern's right fist. The vice-like grip sheared cleanly through his wrist-mounted stormbolter and bit through his vambrace, drawing blood. Stern grunted and lunged forward, driving his blade into the creature's abdomen. The combatants locked. Even after running it through, the possessed wolf still fought, lupine jaws distending with unnatural ease as they snapped and slavered at Stern's helm. Stern spat strings of words from the rites of exorcism channeling the holy willpower of his collected brotherhood into his blade's psycho-sensitive steel. The stab of energy was infinitely more potent than the physical edge, tearing deep into the demon wearing the space wolf's flesh. Like shadows ripped apart by a sudden flood of light, the warp creature was banished back to the Immaterium. The defiled body of the wolf slumped against Stern, dead, infected blood pattering down the demon hunter's silver armor. Stern pushed the body off, commending its lost soul to the Emperor. Around him his brothers fought for their lives. They had been trained almost from birth to destroy Warpspawn. From their blades, adamantium-tipped, forged from blessed silver and blessed by holy water, to their Aegis armor, inscribed with catechisms of hatred and wards of faith, and anointed with sacred oils. Every inch of their being was repellent to the creatures that scuttled and crawled in the darkest corners of mankind's imagination. But the things they fought now were not purely demonic. They were an unholy melding, a dark union between the physical and that which should only have existed in nightmares. The flesh of the possessed wolves did not cringe from purifying silver, and it did not vanish back to the warp when pierced by a righteous steel. The speed, strength, and savagery of the Space Wolves, itself a match for the battle skill of Stern's brethren, had been augmented a hundredfold by the dark cunning and unholy vigor of the things that had come from the warp. The Grey Knights struggled to match them, 
Force weapons clashed with chitin and twisted steel, and claws raked its silver power armor. One of the possessed had locked multiple jaws around Brother Lucan's gorget, tearing open the ceramite with unnatural ease and gorging itself in the flesh of the space marine's throat. Brother Wilfred slammed his force glaive into the creature's scaled flank, bellowing in high gothic. Still, it hung on. Lucan was on his knees, blood jetting from the savage wound. Wilfred rammed his storm bolt into the side of the thing's skull and fired, disintegrating it with a blast of hexagrammically inscribed bolts. Beside him, Brother Tamaz had wreathed another of that former space wolves in the white flames of his incinerator. The thing howled, the sound more like four voices than one, all shrieking together. Even as the flesh melted from its deformed bones, it came on, clutching Tamaz in a fiery embrace. The Grey Knight kicked the charred remains away in time to take a blow from another possessed wolf's hammer-like bony appendage. The impact had dented his helmet and slammed him back into the fleshy walls of the docking spine. Stern parried the chainsword of another possessed. The weapon had melded with the space wolf's arm, black icor now oiling the spinning saw teeth. Stern's sword locked with it, the tendon rotor screaming. The teeth jammed as they tried to chew through the blessed steel. The possessed thrust forward, using its unnatural strength to drive Stern back, a vox grill snapping with freshly sprouted fangs. Brother Captain, Alakar bellowed from behind Stern. Down. The Grey Knight reacted without thinking, going on one knee with his sword still locked. He felt the weight of Alakar's charged force hammer swing overhead. The crackling weapon struck the possessed squarely in the face, pulverizing its horned skull and slamming the body back down the corridor with a concussive blast of released energy. There was no time for thanks. Stern turned his rise into a lunge that impaled the two-headed horror leaping at him. More demons were attacking in the wake of the possessed. A back cut cleaved apart another of the siege horrors in the blaze of multicolored light. A hellsword caught him in a thigh plate scoring a shadow wound above his coos seal. A second hacked deep into his right pauldron, scarring the book and sword sigil of his chapter. Stern parried another blow, his sword a silver blur as he kept two hissing bloodletters at bay. We're losing ground, Gideon shouted over the vox, moments before a hell sword punched into his gut. To Mars, ignition pattern, Stern snapped, throwing Gideon back with a thrust of his pauldron. Scourge formation, slowly. Tamaz adopted a braced stance and unleashed his flamer in a wide arc, covering the corridor from one side to the other. The walls themselves shuddered and writhed beneath the purifying heat. The warp wolves howled and shrieked as their flesh ignited while the flames licked harmlessly across the armor of Stern's paladins. As one, the Grey Knights stepped back, heeding their brother captain's orders to disengage. Artemis, Alakar, and Wilfred snatched the fallen bodies of Lucan and Gideon as they went, the remaining six knights closing protectively around them. Tamaz's flames didn't check the possessed for long. If anything, it only drove the demons into a greater frenzy. They tore through the docking spine, bodies still wreathed in fire. The Grey Knights opened up at point-blank range, hammering them with mass reactive bolts. Report. Stern snapped into the box. A few moments more, Lord, came the strained voice of Stardrake's Huskar. You don't have them, Stern said, parrying the raking claws of a burning, bolt-riddled possessed with a sucking maw for a head. Open the blast doors. Pace by pace, the Grey Knights continued to retreat. When the warp spawn pressed too close, the supportive fire of Wilfred, Alakar, and Artemis from the rear ranks cut them down, while Stern, Osbeth, Simeon, Kaldor, to Mars, Ethold and Latimer hacked, slashed, and stabbed unceasingly at the frothing, snarling tide. Behind him, Stern heard the grate of the docking blast doors rolling open. To Mars, burn them again, he ordered. The fact that the possessed were still clawing at them showed how powerful the warp rift at Gormanyal's heart was. They had to close it, and there was only one way to achieve that now. My last canister, Tamar's Vox, before stepping up once more. 
The roar of holy flames and the shriek of warp spawn filled the corridor once again. The Grey Knights used the precious few seconds to turn, dragging their wounded back into the Star Drake. Hold them here, Stern ordered as he reached the doors. We can give the crew a few moments more. As Tamaz backed through the opening, jetting the remains of his incinerator's Promethium canister after him, the other nine knights halted at the blast doors and unleashed a hail of silver-tipped stormbolt rounds. The corridor, immediately in front of the door, disintegrated in a hail of torn, burning flesh and detonating shells. We've done all we can, Lord. The house cowl's voice crackled in Stern's ear. Disengage from the docking spine, Stern ordered. Now. He slams the ceiling rune next to the blast doors. The heavy adamantium juddered shut just as Tamar stepped inside, his incinerator sputting a few last drops of liquid fire. Moments later, there came the hammering and shrieking of things on the other side, furiously attempting to claw their way inside the Star Trek. Kaldor, Osbeth, take Lucas and Gideon to the medicine bay, Stern ordered. Everyone else remain here, Overwatch Pattern. Ensure there is no breach. I am going to the bridge. There was a thump and a moan of metal as the Grey Knight spoke, and the sounds of pounding from the far side of the blast doors trailed off. We are retreating, Ethel called after Stern as he strode towards the docking bay's grav lift. The big paladin was flicked with dripping, stinking ichor, fits locked around the haft of his force glaive. Stern didn't look back. No. The Star Drake's bridge was a hive of activity. The Huskarl Stern had given temporary command to was standing atop the command days, snapping orders to his kales. In the open vision port, Stern saw Gormanyal hoving into view as the ship detached itself from the docking spine and swung about to face it. Were repairs completed? Stern asked as he strode onto the bridge. The Huskarl bowed hastily. We still cannot root full power to the plasma drives for fear of overloading them, Lord, but to all intents and purposes, yes. The coolant's coupling was 85% complete when we detached. We should make far better time now. Do you have a heading? Not yet, Stern said. Reroute power to the forward bombardment cannon. Lock onto the star fort. I don't care where. Just hit it. Affirmative, Lord, said the Huskarl before barking orders to the gunnery station. Deep in the Star Drake's bowels, whips cracked and chain gangs heaved in the hellish half-light as they dragged a vast bombardment shell into the breach of the strike cruiser's primary cannon. The ship's machine spirit, manifest in the probing of its sensory arrays and auger masts, easily acquired the huge target presented by Gormanyal. Bombardment cannon loaded and locked, Lord, a gunnery call said. Fire. Stern said. Swallowed by the void, there was no sound of any discharge, but the flash of the mighty weapon reflected back from the fort's gleaming bulkheads, and the tremor of its recoil reached the bridge's decking plates. Seconds passed. Then part of the star fort's gaping docking space blossomed outwards, eerily silent, the armor plating blown apart by the point-blank shot and spinning away with a curiously majestic slowness. You were right, Brother Artemis, Stern said, smiling grimly. Gorman Yarl's shields no longer function. He turned to the gunnery station. Huskarl, direct all firepower at the structural weak points. I want to have dealt at crippling damage within the hour, and have your communications bit patch me through to the Fang immediately. For the Fang, Fenris. Lord Crom Dragon Gazer's footsteps led him into darkness. A part of him knew he should not venture into the vaults. It was a cursed place, an icy shaft buried deep into the roots of the mountain. A place of cracked, worn statues and sealed doors, their mechanisms frozen solid with ice. The power had long ago failed, and even the great geothermal reactor coils that helped keep the Fenrisian death chill from Fang's corridors had never reached this deep. This was beyond the Underfang and the halls of the revered Fallen, a place marked on few maps and remembered in even fewer living memories. 
Chrome trod the rock-carved corridors with care, the active hum of his power armor painfully loud in the stony depths. He held a lumen orb in one hand, its pale light picking out the graven alcoves and craggy stairways before him. In a place like this, even the fierce eye didn't want to trust to his senses alone. He passed three war doors before he reached the chamber he sought. He had to search the depths of his long memory to conjure up the correct passcodes, and he felt the static buzz of hexagramic wards and power shields as he passed through each one. Beyond the last lay a great, vaulted room. Crom's orb failed to even pick out its ceiling. The stony glare of a hundred forgotten wolf guards stared down at dragon gaze from their plinths lining the chamber's walls, while row after row of metal caskets filled its open floor. Crom glanced at his visor display, but it told him little. The vox, the chrono counter, and his tracking signal had all failed him. He could have passed into another dimension as far as his auto sensors were concerned. All he had was a temperature reading well below freezing, his spiking vital signs and targeting reticules continually flashing a warning red as they picked up the false outlines of the ancient statues. He deactivated them with a blink, trying to ease his jagged heart rate. Why are you here? He growled to himself, even though he hadn't vocalized it beyond his helmet. The words seemed to echo about in the frozen lost chamber. There was no reply, but he knew the answer anyway. He could not sit and wait in the great halls of the Fang or the rest of his chapter fought and bled across the other homeworld of the Fenris system. He had to try to learn the truth. Perhaps, down here, there would be an insight into the curse that plagued them. The casket he was seeking was the nearest to the war door. It was the last one to have been brought to the haunted depths laid to rest less than four centuries earlier. Crom approached it, his lumen orb flickering, as though reluctant to go any further. The casket was large, steel-bound in brass and big enough to hold Snegger the giant, the broadest warrior in Crom's great company. Its flanks were inscribed with ancient, intricate runic script while a carving of the world wolf was inlaid on its lid. Crom brushed his fingers against it, and felt the throbbing power of an active stasis field within. The wolf law set his orb down beside the casket and unlocked the gauntlet from his left hand, laying it beside the orb. Then he drew his combat knife and nicked the razor steel against the back of his hand. A single line of blood ran down his forefinger. He held it against the gene lock panel set into the casket's flank. There was a whir as the mechanism matched and confirmed the genetic heritage of the sons of Russ. Then there came a thud of bolts and a hiss of pressure sealant as the casket's heavy lid slid slowly back on auto hinges. Crom kept his combat knife out. At first, with the lumen orb still on the ground next to it, the casket's interior was just a well of power-charged darkness. Crom's auto senses were stripping the shadows away when a single small lumen in the casket's top blinked on. What it revealed inside was a horror. The Great Wolf had saved it four centuries earlier on the frigid world of Lumerius, the vile traitors of the Black Legion, led by the insane butcher Fabius Bile, had been hunting for it, desperate to seize its genetic material and fashion an army of nightmares to augment their dark strength. Grimnar and the champions of Fenris had gotten there first, putting the traitors to the sword and rescuing the casket. It had been taken here, to the deepest vaults of the Fang, and here it had lain undisturbed ever since, sleeping the ages away in the frozen darkness. Fang, brother, the lost herald of Rus. Wolfen. The creature had been locked in the casket's inbuilt stasis field, its claws out, features twisted in an eternal bestial snarl. Crom bent forward to look into its eyes, seeking something more than animal hunger in them. As his shadow fell across the wolfen, he got the distinct sense that the thing was looking back at him, aware, every muscle silently straining against its enforced paralysis. The wolf lord straightened hastily. It was not a space wolf, 
Perhaps it had been once, but the heraldry of its ancient power armor belonged to the Wolf Brothers. Theirs was a tragic tale. The only successor chapter ever founded by the Sixth Legion. The genetic legacy of Russ had proven to be too volatile to be replicated beyond Fenris. According to half-remembered, half-believed legend, the Wolf Brothers had been riven by the curse of the Wolfen. Those not killed had been scattered by the tides amidst the sea of stars. The few that still survived were hunted, whether by a misguided Imperium or darker powers. Grimnar had gotten to this one just before the forces of chaos had latched their claws around it. The thought of the warped geneticist Bile capturing a wolfen for his experiments was a terrible one. Looking down at the stasis frozen body of the feral creature, Krom sought reason in its form. Legend held that the wolfen's return presaged that of the Primarch himself. Certainly the old wolf priest Ulrich had thought as much. Others had been less certain. It had long been feared that evidence of the instability of the Canis Helix within the genetic code of the Space Wolves could be used by other Imperial factions to damn the chapter. Now just the scenario was playing out, with the lions occupying the system. What had brought the Wolfen back? Had they returned to combat the demons infesting the system, or were they in fact a part of the Dark God's schemes? unwitting pawns in a plot to annihilate the rout once and for all. Lord, said Vox Haskal Fogel, transmitting from the Fang's communications hub. Crom started, taking a step back from the casket. His Vox had re-established a connection. Sudden anger flashed through him. What had he hoped to achieve by coming down here? There could be no insight into the curse. The Wolfen were animals, pure and simple. Speak. Lord Captain Stern is on the long-range vox. He has urgent news. I'm on my way. He looked down one more time into the wolf brother's eyes. They glared back at him. He wondered for a moment whether in truth his own gaze was any less unsettling. Then he hit the sealant rune and watched the casket's heavy lid lock back into place. The thud of the internal clamps echoed through the chamber. Crom refastened his gauntlet, picking up the lumen orb, and left. The Fang's primary communications array was hushed when the Wolf Lord arrived. He was handed a Voxhorn and a receiver by Fogel. Stern, Crom said into the horn. Report. What's happened? Grim tidings, the Grey Knight replied. I am aboard the Staff Autogorman Yarl. We have recently discovered a full-scale demonic infestation. My brethren and I are too few to purge it, so we are currently bombarding the fort from afar. The infestation has disabled the structure's weaponry and shield capabilities. Has Shipmaster Ranoff consented to this? Crom demanded. No, said Stern. That was the second matter that needed to be discussed. Your shipmaster has succumbed to your genetic curse. I've had to confine him to his own ship's brig. His two crewmates also turned at the same time. We had no choice but to slay them. Days earlier, news that the Great Knights had killed his brethren, Wolfen or not, would have sent spikes of rage stabbing through Crom's thoughts. Now, though, he felt nothing. He had fought tooth and nail alongside stone silver paladins, save the soul of his chapter with their help. The blank, feral glare of the wolf brother had held nothing of the Vilka Fenrikers' martial upbringing and nobility, only its darker, more bestial side. We need more men, Crom said. If what you say is true, Stern, then we must ensure a control of Gorman Yalt's twin, Mjalnar. We cannot afford to leave it infested with weirdlings. Aren't all forces engaged beside your own? Not all, Crom said. Not quite. The Void, Fenris System Do you trust him? Ragnar sneered. I'd as soon as trust one of the weirdlings. He's a member of the Ordos. He exists to persecute and lie. 
Have you ever heard of one of his breed who didn't despise our chapter? And all because we strive to protect mankind, because we dare to wonder the reason for our very existence? Ulvik the Wise, Ragnar's Wolfguard battle leader, nodded. He seemed open enough with his motives, though. If his tale was true, he despises the lions. He would use us as a weapon against them. And well he may if they burn Megadia. If they want a war, they'll have one. The two wolves were conferring privately in Holmgang's stride to Morgai. The place of worship, like much of the ship, recalled the chapter's primal roots. Though the decks and ceiling were plastioplate and iron mesh, the walls were clad in rugged, dark grey stone, mined from the flanks of Asaheim. The lumen strips running down the length of the rune's edges were dimmer in this less visited part of the ship, with much of the power rerouted to the plasma drives. They threw long shadows over the pelt heaped stone altar and cast the features of the two wolves into jagged contrast. Ragnar's eyes gleamed coldly. Do you believe the Inquisitor's tale? Ulvik said. About interrogator chaplain Asmodai? There are many such stories about the sons of the lion, Ragnar said. They are a dark brotherhood. It is little surprise that they should clash with the Ordos, and now the Ordos have come to us. Clearly this de Mornay knows the value of his enemy's enemy. He was a warrior once, Ulvik said. He has the bearing still, despite his age. I smell blood and steel about him. That is at least to be commended, Ragnar allowed. Regardless of whether he intends to use us or not, any who wield the blade in the Allfather's name are useful at a time like this. We are beset, Ulvik agreed, and the packs are hungrier than ever. Weird spawn nor the lions, whoever we next bear our claws against will suffer. The home gang's intercom command channel clicked in Ragnar's ear. Ulvik watched as his Jarl received the Vox Huskal's message. To the bridge, he said, after breaking the link. Trouble? Dragon Gaze is hailing us again. Perhaps he's grown bored, sitting alone in the fang. The half jest fell flat. They hurried to the command deck. Crom greeted them from the static wash display of its main vid feed. It's the Grey Knights, he said. What of them? Captain Stern has just sent me a transmission. Our Ramali Starfeet Gorman Yal has been infested by weirdlings. His brotherhood is too few to purge it, so he's destroying it from afar with one of my ships. We believe Mjalnar may also have been overrun. Have you hailed Mjalnar? Ragnar asked. There's been no contact made with it since the incursions began, Krum said. I fear the demon hunter is correct, and if he is, we cannot afford to leave a mobile warp rift open in the heart of the system. My fleet is the nearest to Mjarnar's current location, Ragnar said, glancing at one of the bridge's glowing hollow charts. But it would delay our arrival at Midgardia. We have no choice, Black Men, Krom said. But there is still no word from Bran Redmore, and all our other forces are fully engaged. You alone can meet this threat. Ragnar grimaced, but nodded. Very well, fierce eyes. My packs will purge Mjallnar. Pray to the Alfar its communications have simply failed, and our brethren yet garrison it. I shall, Krom said. But there is other news from Stern. He discovered Goromanyal's plight after he went there seeking repairs. Apparently, Shipmaster Ranulf of the Star Drake succumbed to the curse along with two others. They damaged the ship before they could have stopped. Are you telling me not to trust my own warfren? I'm telling you to be mindful of those who have not yet turned to young king, Crom said. Whether we accept them into our ranks afterwards or not, having experienced warriors devolving into half-beasts only weakens us. I have more than just a curse to be mindful of, Dragon Gaze, Ragnar said. Have you heard of a hereticus inquisitor by the name of Banis de Morne? I have not. Why? His ship has joined my fleet en route to Midgardia. He seeks to enlist my help in bringing the lions to heal. 
The last thing we need now is the Inquisition's meddling, Crom growled. He claims to believe our Wolfen are free of warp taint. That could make him a valuable ally. Or he could turn on us as soon as he's used us to settle whatever grudge he has with the Dark Angels, Crom said. Tread carefully, Black Men. Don't die always, Dragon Gaze, Ragnar smiled grimly. Crom didn't respond. The transmission ended. Get me the Inquisitor's ship, Ragnar ordered his Voxhaus call. Tell him I am changing course. Svelgard Wrath had arrived. It burst into existence in the depths of Svelgard's oceans, tearing itself free of one of the warp rifts that had pierced the moon's seabed. For the first time since creation, it brought light to the icy deeps. It burned white hot. The fury of its god made manifest. Blood and screams and war steel had drawn it here, a memory of the fury of wolves, and now it would do its god's bidding. The waters around it began to churn and boil. Already billions of gallons from Svelgard seas had plummeted through the warp rifts and into the madness of the Materium. The islands that housed the claws of the world wolf were growing steadily larger, the waters receding from the shores and exposing fresh, jutting rocks, gleaming like bones spiking out from desiccated corpses. Through the flushing tides, the monstrosity known as Infernus blazed. Ahead of it lay the world wolf slayer, and a fight worthy of the blood god. The Void, Fenris System Mjolnar was transmitting. It was not, however, an intelligible signal. The wolf fleet circled the unresponsive Imperial Starforge like a pack sniffing at a frozen corpse, hackles up and fangs bared, wary. Boost the audio, Ragnar ordered from a home gang's bridge throne, leaning towards the Vox Array. The noises emitting from Mjolnar came through more clearly, except they were not really noises at all. The Wolf Lord was reminded of being plunged underwater and having crushing pressure reduce everything to a sort of constant muted rumble. It set his airs on end and sent a strange, icy chill creeping along his shoulders. Cut the link, he said, and put alongside. I want to board immediately. Mjolnar filled home gang's viewing ports, a mountain of silent adamantium threat. Transmission lights and guidance beacons still winged from its crenellated masts and spires, and the star fort's great guns had been run out. Of actual life, however, there was no sign. Lord Inquisitor de Mornay is hailing us, a box Carl said. Speak at us. Ragnar ordered. What happened to our need for haste? De Mornay demanded. There are some duties even the Inquisition cannot countermand, Ragnar replied. Mjarnar is a mighty battle station. If it has fallen, it must be retaken. If it is overrun, it must be destroyed. Every second we delay, Midgardia burns, De Mornay said. Do you think I don't realize that? Ragnar snarled. Do you think I don't ache to close my fist around the throats of those threatening my chapter's words? My wolves have waited too long to pass this kill by. If you wish to face the lions alone, then by all means, carry on to Midgardia. But my packs are my own, and we are boarding Mjolnar. Are you still with us, Inquisitor? There was a long pause. Ragnar sneered. Then the reply crackled over the vox, heavy with finality. I will see you aboard the Starfort, Lord Blackvane. The World Wolf Slayer, Svelgard The seas were retreating. Sven watched them rather than the thunderhawks and storm walls of Harold's great company as they landed amongst the bunkers, bastions, and turrets of the World Wolf's lair. He had already transmitted data links pinpointing where his lines were weakest. Harold's warriors would fill the gaps accordingly, fire howlers and death wolves manning the parapets, 
and fire sleds side by side. But the joy such a gathering of wolves would normally have brought Sven was eclipsed by the mystery of Svelgard's receding seas. The weirdling rift must be widening, Olaf Blackstone said, pointing at the expanse of sodden wet sand that now stretched away from the layer's shingle. The water is disappearing into the materium. At least we'll see the bastards coming, Sven growled. He pointed to a patch of ocean further out, a choppy channel that ran between two of the layer's neighboring islands. It looked as though a bank of fog or steam was rising from the waves, creating a swirling cloud on the near horizon. And what about that? Russ only knows, Olaf replied. Send the godspeed. Agreed, have the area scanned. We've enjoyed enough weird damn surprises. Affirmative. Lord, I am getting movement, said Yingfor of the long fang over the box. Contacts coming ashore from the south. Sven opened a channel to Harold. Are your packs in position, Deathwolf? They are, Bloodhound. Let the wheelings come. We'll make them regret the day they sought to claim Svelgard, Sven said, switching to the company wide channel. All packs, fire at will. Boarding Torpedo 15B, Approaching Mjolnar Ragnar flexed his arms and shoulders. He felt the servo bundles that gave life to his power armor were in response to the motion, while the true flesh and muscle of his transhuman physique stretched. He had been trapped in the void-born prison of his flagship for too long. The hunt called to him. He could already feel the weirdling scum snapping in his grasp, shrieking as he sent them back to the Empyrean. He realized his gauntlets were clenched and let out a long, slow breath. The chrono display counting down on his visor's top right corner still read over a minute before the boarding torpedo impacted into the starfort's flank. He finished recounting the names of his dead pack brothers. It was a ritual he had observed for a long time and he knew it gave comfort to his great company as well as to himself. To know their Jarl valued their lives, counted them as true kin whether amidst the fires of battle or the feasting halls of the Fang, hardened the bonds of pack loyalty. The black manes were all as one. He drew Frostfang. The ancient chainsword felt like an extension of his physical form, his fist closing with familiar certainty around the worn handle. His fingers itched to flick the activation stud. Hidden beneath his helmet's faceplate, he grinned. You're grinning, aren't you? said Tor Wolfhard. And you're not? Ragnar replied. I have ached for this, brother. At last we will join the other great companies in the defense of our homewards. Twenty seconds. He knew he needed to say nothing to the black pelts his wolf guard. They understood what was coming. Like the Allfather's burning war spear, they would plow into the diseased heart of weird spawn infestation, banishing it from the material universe, utterly wiping away the taint of their existence. Five seconds. The boarding torpedo shuddered as it impacted into Mjolnir's flank, latching on with razor limpet clamps. There was a muffled whoosh of heavy meltiguns, followed by the thud and whir of disengaged locks. The pod's assault bay was bathed in bloody red light. Ragnar released his restraint, feeling his adrenaline spiking, breath coming in pants through his armor's filtration systems. The blast doors opened, revealing a circular hole that dripped with molten steel, the edges still glowing from the melter blasts. Ragnar triggered Frostfang, his Vox-amplified howl blending with the chainsaw's savage roar. He leapt through the boarding hatch, fangs bared, straight into a deserted service corridor, and not a demon in sight. The Word Wolf's Lair, Svelgard. This time, the creatures of chaos assaulting Svelgard's beaches struggled. With the addition of Harold's packs to Sven's defenses, the weight of firepower had doubled. 
The receding tides had left the dark cohorts with more open ground to cross before they could reach the outermost defenses of the lair. Squealing and roaring weirdlings were cut to pieces, even as they dragged themselves dripping from the icy waves. The Earthshaker artillery added their firepower from the nearby islands, their strikes sending up great plumes of water and brine as they shelled the gradually expanding southern edge of the lair. Fifteen minutes into the assault, Sven's biggest concern, watching from the ramparts of the lair central keep, was monitoring ammunition expenditure. That all changed with a message from Godspear. The island channel is experiencing a huge temperature spike, the pilot voxed. Something in the water is giving off an energy signature, and it's moving towards the lair. What fresh maleficarum is this? Sven growled. Keep tracking it. Lord, it seems to be rising to the surface. I— The pilot got no further. The water beneath the vapor fog heaved. Something vast powered from the sea and into the steam-wreathed air. Great bat-like pinions unfurled, and black coal flesh that, smoldered with hate, fueled heat, burst into white flames. With a roar that shook the rock crate beneath Sven's mag boots, a burning bloodthirster lunged upwards at Godspear. Sven could only listen to the pilot's startled frantic oaths as he tried to evade the great demon. He watched the Thunderhawks bank desperately, but the fire wreathed monstrosity was infinitely lither in the air. The huge axe it wielded inscribed a fiery arc through Svelgard's grey sky and smashed into one of the Godspear's wings. A single blow cut clean through its armor plating, throwing out a spray of fat sparks. The gunship immediately lurched to one side, its servitor-controlled bolters blasting wildly into the air in all directions. It started to spin out of control amidst a plume of fire and black smoke. Infernus, Sven breathed. He recognized the greater demon. All the wolves did. Its crude, fiery lightness could be found carved across the saga knotwork in four of the great halls of the Fang, recounting the epic battle between it and the wolf lord Jarl Stormpelt many millennia past. Infernus was a tale every Bloodclaw knew, one of the near-mythical monsters that reared its head from the depths of the chapter's glorious past, and now it had returned to help write new sagas with fresh blood. The greater demon had only just begun. It lashed out with a chain whip grasped in its other fist, the heavy, white-hot lynx snagging the damaged Thunderhawk's remaining wing. With a roar like a forgesmith's hammer strike, it twisted its mighty body in midair, directing the godspear's erratic plunge towards the shoreline of its closest island. Sven made out the tiny figures of Ashimilatalum troopers, vainly attempting to scatter as the Thunderhawk's burning shadow screamed over them. The bloodthirster's chain snapped free, and the godspear's wrecked remains hammered into the island's shingle. It plowed a deep furrow into the shore, obliterating a section of makeshift flakboard barricades and wiping the platoon manning them from existence. Then the gunship exploded, a blossoming fireball that blazed across the island's beach as though in sympathy with the fiery monster that had caused it. The blast took more troopers with it, demolishing the western side of the island's defenses. Infernus didn't even pause to survey its handiwork. Wings beating, it launched itself through the air, straight towards the World Wolf's lair. Ramelie's class starfall to designate Mjolnar. Ragnar and his black pelt stood just beyond the hatch of their boarding torpedo weapons drawn. Nothing moved to oppose them. The service corridor was old and quite clearly deserted. The ceiling was a mass of bared coolant piping, and the walls were naked plasteel, inset with cobbed webbed aluminum orbs. Rust discolored every surface, and there was a distant hissing where steam escaped from a ruptured pipe. Although the corridor was clearly time worn and abandoned, there was no weirdling stench about it. Mordecai's head, Ragnar spat feeling his system flush with rage. Where are they? 
No one answered. The old lumen orbs flickered once, but remained mute. Maybe the star fort is free from taint, Uller Greylock growled. Maybe the Grey Knights were wrong. Then where are the crew? Ragnar asked. Why haven't they been responding to our transmissions? He blinked, clicked his visor's vox display. All boarding packs, come in. Hostel spirit here. Meager is back, affirmative. Aeskir is our slayer here, my yar. Contacts? Ragnar demanded. Negatives crackled back at him, the blood claw pack leaders sounding as confused as he was. A rune in his visor lit up and Ragnar switched channels to accept De Mornay's incoming transmission. A trap, the Inquisitor said. It has to be. What makes you so sore? The crew surely wouldn't have simply abandoned the station. We will soon find out, Ragnar replied, switching back to his pack-wide channel. Hustor, take your claws to the escape shuttle bay. It should be a hundred yards down the corridor on your left hand. Yes, Lord, on our way. Ragnar switched back. De Mornay, what's your current location? It appears to be an outer munition shaft for the spinward-facing weapons batteries, De Mornay replied. It's deserted, though. Hold there, Ragnar said. My black pelts and I will join you. Affirmative. Ragnar met Demone at a junction leading to the weapon's batteries. The Inquisitor was still mounted on his palanquin, but his aging body was now armored in flank plate, and an archaic-looking brass case plasma pistol rested in one hand. Alongside him stood his grim-faced Adeptus Sororitas bodyguard, clad in the midnight black purgation pattern power armor of the Order of Our Martyred Lady. You know the Star Force layout, de Mornay greeted the Wolf Lord. It falls under the auspices of the Chapter Fleet, Ragnar replied. It's part of the System Defense Network. All pack leaders have access to its schematics. So what do you propose we do? de Mornay asked. There's something wrong about all this. He gestured with his pistol down the deserted corridor behind the black pelts. An update from Hoster clicked in Ragnar's ear before he could reply. Lord, only half of the escape shuttles were accounted for. Six have jettisoned. There are shuttles missing, Ragnar told de Mornay. The Inquisitor frowned. The riddle grows more complex. If they were all present, I would assume the crew had been slaughtered, but if they evacuated, this place may genuinely be deserted. But why would they leave? Ragnar asked aloud. The central command deck may tell us, de Mornay said. It must have audio and visual logs. And more, it should have recorded the escape shuttle's projected routes, and from there we can set the fort on a more useful course than its current trajectory. Towards Midgardia, for example. He opened the channel to the three blood crawl assault packs that had boarded with him. Converge on the command deck. I want this riddle solved. Transit Line 403 The Underworld, Midgardia They'd found them. Fugulus emitted a blast of noxious spore clouds and pointed excitedly down the rail tunnel. The little pack of wolves had led them to a larger one, and now they'd combined into a single force. Truly, the Grandfather was good. Behind the demonic heralds, his plague-bearers were dragging themselves from the tunnel burrowed by Garnok, the great plague-worm. Garnok himself was writhing down the rail line towards the wolves already, his many more snapping and drooling hungry. Chewing dirt was clearly not enough. The noble beast was desperate for flesh and blood. Fugulus waved after it. Let us blast these great warriors with disease befitting their might, he bellowed at his chanting plague-bearers. Onward, dear friends, onwards! The plague recitals of the infested redoubled in volume and urgency as they set off in Garnock's wake, Fugulus struggling to keep his diseased bulk near the head of his taliban. He could see more than just a fortunate gathering of soon-to-be-blessed wolfmen ahead. He could see the whole glory of a new realm, ripe for the grandfather's benedictions. 
The Midgardian underworld was overly humid, yes, but it was certainly earthy, dark, and dank. All manner of mold, fungi, and rot could be cultivated in its depths. By the time he returned to his grandfather's garden, he would have a host of wondrous specimens to present. The possibilities jostled for attention in the Herald's thoughts, so much so that he barely even noticed when the Taliban crashed into the howling space wolves. The knot of wolves gathered around Logan Grimnar's fallen crown turned, weapons revving to life. The air was thick with spores misting their view further back up the transit tunnel. Shapes were limping through the rancid smog, shuffling and moaning with throaty, bile-choked voices. That worm, Leonard snarled. Eagle followed his gaze and saw that the huge demonic worm had returned. It writhed down the tunnel with a hideous peristalatic motion, its blind moors agape, and once again a clutch of rotting lesser demons were following in its wake, using the tunnel gnawed by its multi-fang jaws to transverse Midgardia's underworld. Take the beast, Eagle said. We'll close the tunnel again. Then we can purge the foul thing together. It must not be allowed to escape this time. Lenold only nodded, already moving to meet the worm head on. Eagle launched himself into the plague bearers crawling through the tunnel in the rail highway's wall, his iron guard beside him. They had to be quick. The counter on his visor showed the toxicity levels in the air rising rapidly. This Taliban had clearly brought the surface's corruption with it into Midgardia's depths. The Iron Wolf's power claw shredded the first plague bearer he reached for, its rancid form disintegrating into a puddle of decomposing sludge. Eagle went through a second and a third, snarling with rage. The memory of the Great Wolf's broken crown lent every blow a furious, unstoppable strength. How dare these weak, putrid monsters threaten his chapter with destruction! How dare they seek to turn and warp everything the wolves had defended for so long for so many millennia? The plague bearers parted before him, their endless maddening chance for once falling silent. One of their number pressed to the foray. This one was larger, standing ahead taller than the things around it. Its frame was bloated and riven with suppurating sores, its lone cyclopean eye blinking with an unnatural intelligence from beneath one curling horn. It gripped a pockmarked sprawled sword in its fist, worm fingers writhing around the hilt. It was a herald, a leader of the Taliban's. Eagle raised his wolf claws, their power snapping, acknowledging the challenge. The herald struck. Remelies Class Starfort, Designate Mjolnir the fastest route to the command deck from here is via the barracks blocks, Ragnar said. Crack information. Don't hesitate to engage if you make contact. Inquisitor. He turned to face De Mornay. Stay close, but don't get in the way. De Mornay simply shrugged. Lead on, Lord Blackmane. The black pelt set off, Ragnar at the foray. They followed the service chute to a side door that led to a mesh walkway passing over a vast set of throbbing coolant spheres, used to douse the Star Force heavy artillery when it glowed hot from repeated use. Beyond it lay a communications subterminal. The Vox banks had been shut down, their screens blank, horns silent. That explains why we've not been picking up a signal, De Mornay said. But why do we activate them? We'll find out soon enough, Ragnar growled. He was following the heads-up schematic display of Mjana, overlaid with the three runes representing the other boarding packs. The system was suffering from some sort of interference. The runes showing the locations of the blood claws kept blinking from existence, then reappearing nearby, yet only fractionally closer to the command deck of the Star Fort Heart. Ragnar boxed them, but all reported good progress, and still there was no sign of life, whittling or otherwise. Beyond the Vox terminal was the barracks block. Ragnar glanced into one of the cells as they passed its bunk beds were pristine, and kit bags still sat in files along the floor. 
It was as though Mjolnir's crew were all still present but had simply become invisible. The Wolf Lord snarled with frustration. The Vox transmissions from the other packs were similarly unhappy. Mager reported he'd come up against a dead end that didn't exist on the schematics and had been forced to turn back. Asgir made a similar report moments later. He found himself in a Medicaid bay that supposedly didn't exist. The pack leader's voice was strained and Ragnar caught the sound of snarling in the background. The noise shook a growl from his own throat, and his black pelt responded in sympathy. They were all hungry, all frustrated. They passed through the barracks, the command deck just ahead. Ragnar punched in the runes on the security doors, haste forcing him to re-enter them twice. His grip on Frostfang tightened. The doors slide back to reveal. The outer service corridor, the same one they'd first entered Mjano through. The hole bored by their boarding pod's melters still gaped in the far wall, its molten edges now jagged and hardened. Ragnar just stared. The schematics must be wrong, Tor said, voice choked. Outdated. Ragnar realized he was panting. His vision flickered, colors flashing in and out of focus like a picked caster switching between high and low resolution. He could smell blood, coppery and insistent. His jaw ached and his fingers itched. Anger flooded his mind. This wasn't what they were here for. This wasn't what he'd insured the Sea of Stars for. Fenris was beset and his warriors were wandering the corridors of some damn deserted star fort. He needed to kill now. They all did. It's a trick, de Mornay was saying, attempting to penetrate the fog of blood loss that was gripping the wolves. They're trying to confound you, trying to trigger your curse. The star fort is as infested as the one the Grey Knights purged. A trick, Ragnar grunted, shaking his head slowly. No blood. He needed to spill blood. He could taste it in his mouth. His fangs were starting to distend. Frostfang was screaming at him to kill. We're here, de Mornay shouted, plasma pistol whining with charge. All around. The sudden crackle in the scent of ozone cut through Ragnar's consciousness. The young king gasped and blinked as though only just waking from a long, dark nightmare. He realized ozone was not the only things he could smell. The unmistakable stench of weird taint was suddenly everywhere. Shrieking with rage, the demons broke their illusion and flung themselves upon the space wolves. The Rock in High Orbit Above Midgardia Far below, fire bellowed and spread. The Elazar Thing, the Changeling, watched it from the rock's vast, stain-tainted bridge viewing ports. From so far away, it looked like an insignificant thing at first. The Death Storm missiles unleashed by the Imperial Navy's capital ships were like little shards of starlight, quickly lost on their way to the surface. They bloomed again amidst Midgardia's purple shades, little pricks of light set against the diseased darkness. Only when those pinpricks eventually began to meet and cluster did they truly start to spread. The changeling didn't bother to control its grin, masked as it was by Elazar's skull helm. The flames grew and flourished until they had embraced a third of Midgardia's visible surface, black ash clouds starting to obscure the upper atmosphere. A part of the changeling wished it could be down there experiencing the raw chaotic annihilation in person. Perhaps in a different existence among one of fate's many other paths, it would walk the surface of Midgardia during its fiery execution. It would see the inferno devouring the planet's diseased, infected foliage, bursting blighted bark and setting light to the surfaces of the pus bogs. It would see Talibans, sent blazing back to the warp, just as fires roasted the human people of Midgardia and gutted the spires of the magma gates. Only into the underworld would the flames fail to reach. That did not concern the changeling. There would be more than enough time to deal with those lost wolves. Grandfather Nurgle would be infuriated by the torching of his new possession. The thought only fueled the changeling's delight. 
in all of creation and uncreation, only its master knew the final form of the tapestry it wove from fate's threads. But even the small patch the changeling saw before it was glorious to behold. The Elazar thing snapped its gaze away from the sight of the burning world. It had let its thoughts drift. There was still work to be done. Swiftly, it turned from the viewing ports and paced from the bridge, back towards the interrogator chaplain's cell. Midgardia was only the beginning. Iron Requiem, in high orbit above Svelgard. Iron Captain Terek reached out and touched the soul of the machine. The clan commander felt the spirit of his battle barge rise up from the depths as he finished plugging himself into Iron Requiem's command throne, neural links, spine cords, and gene coils, draped with purity seals, binding him to the center of the bridge. Terek always found it a thrilling sensation to commune so directly, so intimately with something that he had never known the weak constraints of the flesh. Iron Requiem was ancient. It had forged through the stars and brought the Emperor's light to the darkest reaches of the galaxy for almost eight thousand years. Yet the soul of the machine was anything but old and sluggish. It spoke to Terek freely, as an old friend, of its pride at the successful land strike against Morkai's keep, twinned with its shame at unleashing its weapons upon Brother Adeptus Astartes. Terek quietened its fears. The space walls were at best mutants and at worst traitors. They were barbarous savages who had run rampant through the stars, unchecked by any authority for far too long. Now the Iron Hands would help bring them to heal. Terek had deactivated his bionic eyes. Now he saw directly through Iron Requiem's auger arrays. The data fed back to him in a steady stream through the throne's many ports. Svelgard hung below them, a little blue-gray orb framed by the vast icy sphere of a Frostheim behind it. Around the orb clustered around what looked from a distance like swarms of airborne insects. With the thought, Terek increased the auger magnifications, picking out individual ships from among the fleet that hung around the moon. Most were Astra Militarum mass transporters and Imperial Navy battleships. But Terek also noted the proud blue heraldry of a sleek Ultramarines strike cruiser. As per the agreed plan, the sons of Gilliman had not yet committed any of their guards to Svelgard's surface, allowing the Astra Militarum and the atmospheric aircraft of the Imperial Navy to secure the island beachheads. They would be sufficient to assess the threat and from there decide whether to reinforce the wolves or destroy them with their moon. Only once the enemy's main strength had been pinpointed would the Angels of Death commit themselves. As a strategy, it was both simple and logically optimal. The clan company's Iron Father had gone so far as to compute an 87% likelihood of success. Such figures brought Terek as close to pleasure as was possible nowadays, but unknown factors still remained. One of those was playing out even as Iron Requiem joined the rest of the Crusade fleet around Svelgard. Terek noted multiple sensors tracking a powerful energy signal on the surface below. Visual scanning was struggling to map a reliable image of the thing causing the disturbance. Whatever it was, it appeared to be never born in nature. Terek filtered the garbled Astra Militarum Vox messages being translated back to their commanders in orbit. Fire. Death. Rage. Terek assessed and dismissed each keyword in turn. Wings, axe, blood, demon. Greater demon. Bloodthirster. He felt even the mighty spirit of Iron Requiem shudder as they made the joint realization of what was attacking the claws of the world of below. One of Korn's mighty champions had burst into being beneath the moon's cold waves. That could only mean the warp rifts were even more unstable than they had initially calculated. The sooner he acted, the better. His implants calculating range, azimuth, diffraction, and speed projections to Iron Hand's captain began to plot another firing solution for his battle barge's lance battery.